We invest in financial products like stocks, gold, bonds, mutual funds, etc. to earn good returns from them. And the search almost always starts with the returns that the asset has given in the past, which is what we typically refer to as historical returns. So for instance, say I tell you that this mutual fund has delivered 15%, to which your follow-up question might be, in which year? And I respond back to you by saying that this is the last year's return. Now you know and I know that this information is not going to be enough for you to take a decision. In fact, you need to look at returns over multiple years and in different situations, which includes ignoring some outlier moments. Effectively, you need to look at three kinds of returns, the annual returns, the trailing returns, and the rolling returns. And so in this video, we shall understand each of these return types, including what they mean, how they are calculated, their limitations, and which one should you use for which occasion. Let's begin. The annual return is a term used to represent the percentage profit or percentage loss made on an investment over a period of one year. For example, say the NAV of a mutual fund on the 31st of December 2020 is 60 rupees. And the NAV one year later, that is on the 31st of December 2021, is 100 rupees. So 100 divided by 60 minus 1 is the mutual fund's annual return, which comes to 66.6%. And this way, one can calculate the annual returns of financial years, calendar years, of gold, of stocks, of mutual funds, real estate, and numerous other assets. And while annual returns look very simplistic, they serve their purpose, especially in understanding the performance consistency of an investment product. Like in the case of SBI multi-asset allocation fund, this graphical rendition of the annual returns shows that with the exception of 2018, this fund has historically delivered between 10 and 15% returns like clockwork. The same approach can be applied in measuring a scheme or portfolio's annual performance against the yearly returns of its benchmark. For instance, here's a performance screenshot of ET Money Genius high growth portfolio as measured against its benchmark, which is the category average of flexi cap funds. We see here that the Genius High Growth Portfolio has handsomely beaten the average FlexiCap fund by at least 4% in most years and by even 20% in some years. Of course, these numbers do change on a daily basis and you can always access the updated ones on the ET Money app at any time. Now, while annual returns gives you a clear start on where to look at and what to compare it with, it does come with a serious limitation. You see, when one is just looking at annual returns, there is a big chance of the recency bias setting in, which makes investors give more weightage to near-term results rather than a series of results over a period of time. Let me explain this point better with a quick sketch. Now, notice here that during the COVID-induced crash in March of 2020, Fund A, which is shown in blue, did not fall as much as Fund B, which is visible in red. In numbers, Fund A fell by just 20%, while Fund B had a steeper fall of 35%. And in the one year after that, that is from April 2020 to March of 2021, Fund A's NAV rose by 50%, while Fund B's NAV was up by 75%. Now, an amateur investor might look at the last one year annual returns and conclude that Fund A is a poor performer but when one looks at the entire 14-month period, then it becomes apparent that it was actually Fund B which had the worst record. Essentially, the fact that Fund A did not fall as much as Fund B created this statistical distortion in the mind of the investor, which is perhaps the biggest concern when using annual returns. Trading returns aim to resolve the limitation posed by annual returns by helping investors measure the average annual return between two dates. Let me jump into it by extending our previous example. So our fund had an NAV of 60 rupees and an NAV of 100 rupees on the 31st of December 2020 and 2021 respectively. Now let's add a few more numbers to this, particularly the NAV of the same fund on the 31st of December for the year 2017, 18, and 19. 
So now we have four completed years to consider and the simple rule for finding trailing returns is to ignore everything that's there in the middle. In other words, we consider only the first and the last points in the transaction, which in our case comes to 30 rupees and 100 rupees, which were the respective NAVs on 3112 2017 and 3112 2021. Consequently, the four year trailing return for this mutual fund would come to 100 divided by 30 raised to the power 1 by 4 minus 1, which in our case comes to 35.1%. The important point here is that we have ignored annual performances which have swung wildly from plus 83% to minus 23% and we have purely focused on the start and end number to arrive at the trailing or the average annual return. In other words, trailing returns smooth out the asset's performance over many years and definitely provides a wider picture of performance as compared to just annual returns, which is why our genius portfolios make it a point to not only show our investors the trailing return across many years, but it also helps them compare it with the benchmark's trailing returns. Now, on the flip side, trailing returns do come with certain limitations. The first limitation is that trailing returns measure performance for just one block of time, which means they ignore to reveal the consistency or volatility of the fund. For example, here's fund A, which has delivered X percent returns over time, and it has done that in a consistent and linear manner. Now compare that with fund B, which has also delivered the same trailing returns of X percent, but has been a lot more volatile. So while the result is the same, the path taken by both funds are different, which is something that trailing returns fails to capture or report. What this also means is that there is also an element of luck or timing when it comes to trailing returns, which can really complicate matters when we add the recency bias to it. Unlike annual and trailing returns, the concept of rolling returns is based on calculating returns for a particular period of time on a continuous basis. This might sound a little confusing when one hears it for the first time, so here's a quick example. So say we want to see the 5-year rolling return of a fund over a 10-year period, let's say from 2011 to 2021. The first step in the process is to find the five-year trailing return for the first five-year tranche, that is from 2011 until 2016. Next step, and remember we said rolling returns is about calculating returns on a continuous basis. So step two will be to find the five-year annualized return continuously for all subsequent five-year periods. So R1 was 2011 to 2016. And therefore, R2 is the period from 2012 to 2017, R3 is 2013 to 2018, and so on and so forth, until we reach the sixth and final five-year period, which extends from 2016 until 2021. Which means effectively, rolling returns is not about finding one single number, like what we saw with average returns or trailing returns, but it's about getting a series of returns. And while we did a five-year rolling return, we could have easily done it for any time period, including one for three months, six months, three years, six years, 10 years, etc. For example, here's how ET Money Genius displays its updated rolling return table for any of our six mutual fund and stock plus ETF portfolios. Again, notice here that we have a one-year rolling return, a two-year rolling return, three years, four years, all the way to 15 years, and what's remarkable is the level of performance consistency the genius portfolios are able to achieve irrespective of the time that is spent in the market. Like in this case, and this is the high growth stock plus ETF portfolio, notice that the rolling returns from three years all the way to 15 years produce a median return of 20 to 22%. Of course, this is happening because of our algorithm, which tracks, allocates, and rebalances the portfolio periodically while working within an acceptable volatility target. But the point I want to stress here is that rolling returns offer a more comprehensive and realistic way of looking at returns, and the more overlapping cycles that an investor sees, the more sense can be made out of that data. Yet another advantage of rolling returns that I particularly like is the range of returns that they offer. You see, when we display the median rolling returns in the Genius Portfolio table, we also show investors the historical probability of how likely is it that your returns will be over 8%.
For instance, if we see the any three year row, we find that irrespective of whichever three year period one picks up, there is a 97.8% chance of one making at least 8% when investing in a genius high growth stock plus ETF portfolio. This is obviously a tall claim, but this is what our back tested performance data is showing as of today. Of course, this 97.8% number keeps changing on a daily basis and we continually update it. But to explain the concept of probabilities better, let's look at a more broader example. This table here shows the probability of earning a certain percentage of returns when investing capital in the Nifty 500 index. For instance, if one were to stay invested in the stock markets for 15 years, then there is historically a 90% chance of earning at least a 12% return irrespective of the time that one enters the market. Now this is strong information and with data like this, an investor can visualize market cycles better and also manage one's expectations from an index fund or on the basis of one's own portfolio. Net-net rolling returns removes the biases by examining performance across time scales, which then helps in normalizing variations. And if there is one limitation I can call upon with regards to rolling returns, then it is that this concept in itself is relatively complex and there is no clear-cut formula to compute it in an instant. To put it all together, all three types of returns, that is annual returns, trailing returns and rolling returns, have their utility for different purposes. So while annual and rolling returns helps us gauge performance consistency or the volatility of a fund or a portfolio, trailing returns aren't that useful in that department. However, trailing returns do play their part in showcasing investors the compounding effects on returns. All said and done, it is fair to conclude that there is no single return type that should be the sole focus of inquiry or tracking for any investor. In fact, narrowly focusing on only one type of return might make you lose the big picture and we explain that with a few examples in this video. So be wise and consider annual, trailing and rolling returns when making your investing decisions. And with this, we come to the end of this video. I hope you learned something new today and will share this video with your friends and family members that are just starting out on investing. Do tap on that like button, do subscribe to our YouTube channel and I look forward to catching up with you next week on another video. Until then. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully.